You know, it's always interesting when uh, I have the opportunity to preach and people find out that I'm preaching, uh, you know, the expressions I get and when I actually step behind the pulpit and I look out and I see the different expressions, there's usually uh, three expressions that I get or comments. It's like, oh yeah, Brother Joe's going to preach today. <laughs> then there's that, oh, Brother Joe's going to preach today. <laughs> and then, who's Brother Joe, you know? So, um, but anyway, so those are the ones that I get. And just uh, so for our visitors, those who have been visiting, who might not know who I am, because I'm usually up there in the tech booth with all those wonderful guys up there. Uh, making sure everything is running right down here for Brother Ben and for Pastor. Uh, I am the student pastor here at First Baptist Church. And so I work with the teenagers from 6th grade to 12th grade. And so today, as I am sharing with you the Word of God, if it sounds like I am talking to you like a teenager, there's probably a reason. Uh, but anyway, so that's who I am. And I am thankful for the privilege I have today to bring the Word of God to you. And, and I, I was thinking, I was told the last time I preached, uh, somebody shared with me that I made them uncomfortable. And I'm not going to call them out or anything. I don't want to embarrass them. Uh, but, but they said, you kept looking at me. And, and so I have a habit uh, that's developed over the years. I look back and forth, and apparently I, I kept looking at this person because they made me comfortable, and, and, but I made them uncomfortable. And it, it was Ben. Okay. And, and so, so I made Ben uncomfortable. So if I'm looking at you while I'm preaching, I promise I'm not calling you out or I'm not saying anything about who you are or what you're doing. I promise it is just a habit of looking back and forth and looking at faces. And to tell you the truth, I believe in being totally transparent and honest. There are some of you that I love looking at while I'm preaching because you encourage me. And then there are others of you that I avoid looking at because you scare me. Okay? So I just want you to be aware of that. I don't want you uh, to uh, be offended or think that I am calling you out in any way. But anyway, welcome to church on this Palm Sunday. I am so thankful, as I said, to be able to share the Word of God with you today. And, and you know, it's not something I get to do often, but when I do it, uh, I really want to do my very best to share with you what the Lord has laid on my heart. Uh, I am not the greatest of speakers, but I do love the Word of God, and I love what God has called me to do. And so if you will take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke chapter 18 this morning, Luke chapter 18, I want to share what God has placed on my heart uh, for you today. Palm Sunday. It starts what we call Holy Week or the Passion Week. And the Passion Week is that period of time from this Sunday to Easter that we celebrate or remember uh, what Jesus did in the last week of his life and what he did accomplished for us on Calvary's cross and the grave. That, that is what Holy Week or the Passion Week is about. It is about what Jesus has done, what he did in that last week of life. And, and when we think about the Passion Week, it begins in Scripture with Jesus coming into uh, Jerusalem on the donkey with his disciples in the crowd uh, crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Uh, to the one that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, and they're shouting praises to him, and they're throwing their coats and palm branches before him as he rides in. And as the week starts, there's this joy for the, the coming Messiah, this joy and belief that, that the Messiah has come to set up his kingdom. And then as the week progresses, it gets gloomier. It gets dimmer. This light that they had at the beginning of the week towards the end of the week. Because on Friday, we see the crucifixion of the Savior. We see his death, and then we see his burial, and then we see his resurrection on what we call Easter Sunday. But, but that is the Passion Week. And when I was first um, introduced to the Passion Week, when I was a young Christian, I, I hadn't been saved for very long, and, and I was introduced to the Passion Week... I didn't understand it fully because, you know, in, in my young Christian mind and in my thinking, I, I was thinking of the word passion with what Christ had gone through. And, and the definition that we have for the word passion today means an almost uncontrollable desire for something. And so I was sitting there as a young Christian and I was questioning who on earth would desire the suffering that Christ went through? 
Who would have an uncontrollable desire to want to go to the cross to suffer what he suffered uh, for humankind? I, I know it's Jesus, and I know, you know he came with a purpose to do that, but in my mind I'm like, who has that kind of passion? And then I learned that as I progressed in my faith and understanding of the Word of God, that, that when that term was first introduced to describe the Passion Week, it was not describing his, his desire for the cross, but the word passion at that point in time literally meant suffering. So when we talk about the Passion Week or the Passion of Christ, we're talking about the week of suffering. We're talking about the suffering of Christ. And so it made more sense to me. I understood this passion of Christ. It talks and speaks to his suffering. But let me say that as I have progressed in my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and my understanding of his word, I truly believe with all confidence that the word that we have today, the word passion as it's defined today with this desire for something, also fits what Christ did during this week. We ask the question again, why would anybody desire pain and suffering? And I would tell you that Christ desired pain and suffering because as the song said today, he saw what was on the other side. See, when Jesus came into this world, he came with the mission, one mission, and that was to reconcile man to the Father. That was to reconcile <laughs> humanity back to God and, and to make a way of redemption for every person who has lived, is living, or will live upon the face of the earth. He came with that one single mission, and yes, he had to suffer and die for that, but, but he found passion in it, he found joy in it, because he saw you. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, yes, passion refers to Jesus' suffering, but it also refers to his uh, desire, his incredible desire to redeem humanity back to God. Because he saw through all the pain and the suffering, and he saw each and every one of you. He saw me. He saw every person on the outside of this building, every person in this world, again, who has lived, who is living, who will live. He saw each and every one of them, and that was his joy. Amen. He endured it for the joy that was set before him. And you need to understand, and I need to understand, we are that joy. That's why he had a passion for what he did. That's why he had a passion for what he did. And this week, we set it apart to celebrate all this. We, we set it apart to reflect on it. But the truth is, it is something that should be so much a part of our lives as followers of Christ that it is, it, it is in front of us each and every day. From the moment we wake up to the moment we lay our heads on our pillows at night, this Passion week, this passion that Christ had for us, his suffering and his desire to go through the suffering for the joy of reconciling us back to himself, that should be in front of us each and every day. We should take joy in that for what he has done for us. This morning in the book of Luke chapter 18, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read the word of God. In Luke chapter 18... Verse 31, it says this, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, or insulted, and spit upon. And they shall scourge, or whip him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. They couldn't grasp it. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging, and hearing the multitudes pass, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before him rebuked him and that he should hold his peace. But he cried the much more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. 
And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What will you have me do to you? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive your sight. Thy faith has saved thee. Amen. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Oh, Let's yes. pray this morning. Father, we come before your throne. Thankful for what we're celebrating this week. Thankful for all that has been uh, accomplished for us in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for all that you have done, all that you're going to do in our lives. And, and, and we just want today to thank you and worship you and, and just, Lord, call out to you and let the world know what you've done for us. We are so thankful. We are so appreciative of what we have. But Father, today, as we open up your word, as we look at your truths, I pray that, that it would be something that we just wouldn't listen to, something we wouldn't just uh, say, oh, this is, you know, the Passion Week or Holy Week, and these are the messages that we have, but this is something that we take with us as we leave here and as we go out, out into this world. I pray it's something that that becomes a part of who we are, a very part of our nature as followers of Christ. I pray that you today would open our hearts and our minds to the truth of your word. I pray, Father, that you would use me as an instrument in your hand. And, Father, we'll give you the glory for anything and everything that's done and accomplished here today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A time before Jesus and his disciples enter into Jerusalem, where Jesus is riding that donkey and the crowds are crying, Hosanna in the highest, and, and people are laying the palm branches in their coats before the Lord, before his crucifixion and, and his burial and his resurrection, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and he's getting ready to pass through the city of Jericho. But before he gets to the gates of Jericho, he, he takes the time to pull his small group of disciples to the side and, and he says to them, you need to listen to me. Here's what's getting ready to take place and here's what's getting ready to happen to me. And he says, beginning in verse 32, he says, I shall be delivered unto the Gentiles. I shall be mocked, spitefully entreated or, or insulted, spit upon. They'll scourge me. They'll put me to death, and on the third day, I'll rise again. Now, this is the third time that Jesus has specifically spoken to his disciples about what's going to take place uh, at the end of his life, what's going to take place during this Passion Week. A and even now, they still can't comprehend everything that's going to take place. But Jesus is laying out the gospel for us. He talks about what he is going to go through and what he is going to suffer uh, for humanity. And he lets his disciples know this is what's going to take place. You need to be prepared for this because this is what I came to do. And this message, this gospel message about the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, this gospel that he shares with them, these events that are going to take place in his life, these are things that as children of God, we, as Christ was passionate about these things for us because we are his joy and he has a desire to reconcile us to himself, we should be passionate about the gospel to share it with other people so that other people can receive what we've received. We should be so passionate about the gospel that we want other, other people to share in what we have been given, what we've been singing about today. We should have that desire to see other people come to Christ. Amen. But the gospel, you know, for years I've heard different people use the word gospel to describe different things. Even in churches, it's like we continually add things to the gospel. What is the gospel? And people will ask, what is the gospel? And we will add this biblical portion of scripture and this biblical portion of scripture. We'll say this is part of the gospel. But, but in truth, what Jesus has laid out is the gospel. The apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 actually declares that the gospel is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the scriptures and his burial and his resurrection according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. 
There's nothing more to it. There's nothing less to it. And, and that is what we as his children, as his followers, are to proclaim. And that is what he is sharing with his disciples here. This is what I have to go through. This is the purpose for which I came, is to suffer. Because on the other side of my suffering, I have joy. I have each and every person that is going to receive me as their Savior. I have each and every person that's going to come to me and it's going to be reconciled and, and, and it's going to have that personal, intimate relationship with me. This is the purpose for which I came. And I wonder if we really get it. I wonder if we really understand what Jesus went through. I, I wonder if we truly have that picture in our mind because I don't think we do sometimes. Because I really believe that if we had a true picture of what Jesus suffered for us and what Jesus went through, that we would have different lives, that we would be so transformed by it that we couldn't help but live differently and be different out in a dark, lost world. But too many times the people of God, they leave the church on Sunday morning not transformed, not changed, and they go into the world, they act like the world, they enjoy the world, and, and what Christ has done for them has not transformed them. I believe if we had a real picture of what Jesus suffered for us, that we would be transformed. And so what did he do for us? He, he lays it out here for us, but, but what did he do for us? When we think about everything that Jesus went through, I, I can remember when I was a child before I was saved, and I can remember after I received Christ as my Savior, I would go into churches and people's homes, and I would see pictures of the crucifixion. I would see uh, a picture of Jesus, uh, this pale Jesus with his long hair and his beard, hanging on a cross with a crown of thorns, a little trickle of blood coming down here, a little trickle of blood coming out of his hand, out of his feet. And, and, and people would point to that in their churches and, and in their homes and say, that's what Jesus did for us. That, that is a picture of the crucifixion. And, and I would tell you today that, that those pictures are lies. Because that is not what our, our Lord suffered. That is not what he went through. Because Jesus tells us right here exactly what he went through. And I think that we need to come to an understanding and get a true picture of what Christ suffered for us. He was handed over to the Gentiles. He was handed over to the Romans. And, and this was after being arrested and going through a mock trial and, and, and being falsely accused by the Jewish leaders of, of countless things. And, and so he's handed over uh, to Pilate, over to the Romans. And, and while he's there, uh, uh, Pilate, who, who tries to get him out of all of this, winds up brutally beating him. See, Jesus was mocked. He was spit upon. He was scourged. And see, the Roman soldiers who did the beating, they were, they were special Roman soldiers. They were specifically trained to do what they did to Jesus. And, and this is where I think we miss uh, the, with the pictures and everything and the image of the crucifixion that we have and what we have in our mind Jesus went through. When Jesus was beat, he was beat from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He was beat by these Roman soldiers who were specifically trained to bring pain upon people. <laughs> And the whip that they used would have different lashes on it, sometimes between six and nine lashes on it, with hooks on the end of them. They would have sharp objects tied to the end of them, and they were trained to wrap that around a person's body. The hooks would dig into his flesh, and as they ripped back, flesh would fly off of the person who was being beat. Muscle would be exposed, organs would be exposed, and they did that to Christ from his head to his toes. And, and the Bible actually says back in Isaiah 52 verse 14 that he no longer looked human, that he, his face was so disfigured that he did not look like a man. And so when you see those pictures of the crucifixion, understand that Jesus did not look like that on the cross because Jesus no longer looked like a human being. He had flesh ripped from his body. He had muscle ripped from his body. He had parts of his insides exposed. Thank and he did it because he had the joy that was set before him. He had you. He had me. He did that for you and for me. He didn't have to do it, but he chose to do it. Thank you, Jesus. And then bleeding to death already, blood everywhere. He walks the road to Calvary. Starting out carrying his cross, 
exposed muscle, muscle and, and, and beat up flesh and everything, and that cross with all of its splinters digging into that, and finally that's taken from him, and he still has to walk, and he's weak, he's, he's losing blood everywhere, <laughs> and as he's walking, he still has people spitting on him and, and slapping at him and taking his beard and ripping it from his face. And he endured it all because he saw the joy that was set before him. Thank you, Jesus. He gets to Calvary. The cross is laid down. And still he could call angels to deliver him. He could call angels to destroy the world and deliver him from all of this. But he still, because of his passion, the joy that's been set before him, he lays down on that cross, willingly lays down on that cross. And he lays out that first arm. And they take that spike. And it's not a little nail. It's not a railroad spike. It is a spike that, that is probably two or three uh, or two, one or two feet long. It comes to a very sharp point, And they drive it between those two bones right there. Bursting all the arteries and veins. Releasing all the blood there that's left going through there. And, and, and they do that to him. And then they take and they stretch out the other arm. And guess what? It doesn't reach. So they stick their foot into his side. Like most Roman crucifixions had to be done. Stick their foot into his side and dislocate his shoulder. So the arm will reach farther across. And they nail it down in the same way. Thank you, Jesus. They take his feet and put them on top of each other. And put a board underneath it. And they bend his knees up. And then they drive a nail, a spike through both of his feet and take the board away. So Jesus is literally hanging there with his knees bent. And the only way he can breathe is by taking and pushing up on that nail that's going through his feet to take one breath. And then he has to hang again. And he endured it for the joy that was set before him, you and me. Jesus has shared all of this with his disciples. This is my purpose. This is why I'm here. And it didn't end there. He said, and on the third day, I'm going to get up. I'm going to rise again. Hallelujah. He says, I'm going to finish it. But we, as his children, we need to be passionate about this gospel. Jesus said, the fields are wide unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into the harvest. There are people who need to hear the gospel of Christ. There are people who need to know this message of redemption. And, and, and Jesus calls us to go out to tell other people. And I hear it all the time. I hear people say, if people are going to hear the gospel, then they can come to church. And I praise God for every person who walks the aisle to get saved <coughs> during a worship service. But we need to understand that the gathering together of the church is not for the purpose to see people saved. It is for the edification and building up of the body of Christ so that we can be charged up, so that we can be encouraged, so that we can go out and do what Christ has called us to do. We praise God for every person who walks the aisle to get saved. But Jesus said to go to the highways and hedges and beckon them that my house might be filled. It wasn't to stay inside the walls and wait for them to get here. He says, go out and tell them what I've done for them. Amen. Every person who names the name of Christ should be passionate about the gospel to go out and share it with everybody. The harvest is white. The laborers are few. Go out and beckon them that his house might be filled. In all four Gospels, in the book of Acts, in some form or fashion, Jesus declared, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God never intended for his people to simply come to church on Sunday and stay within the walls of a building. He intended for his church to go out and actively tell people about Christ and what he did for them, what he accomplished on the cross, what he accomplished through his resurrection, so that they too could go to heaven and have eternal life with him. Amen. We need to be passionate about the gospel. Who was the last person you shared it with? Who was the last person you told Hey, have you heard what Jesus did for you? When was the last time you said, hey, can I tell you what Jesus did for me? How many co-workers do you have that are going to hell? How many students or friends at school do you have that are going to hell? How many family members do you have that are going to hell? 
were to go to highways and hedges and beckon them that his house might be filled. We need to be passionate about the gospel. His disciples, I think it's interesting, his disciples, the Bible says here, that they didn't understand what he was saying. It was hid from them. And literally, it, it carries with it the idea that, that it was veiled. They, they were so caught up in what they had been taught a, as Jewish children and as adults, they were so caught up in their personal agendas that they couldn't see past what they wanted from Christ in order to see his true purpose here on earth. See, they believed that Jesus was on his way to set up his kingdom, that he was going to Jerusalem to declare himself as king and to overthrow the Roman government, that he was the Messiah and that he was going to rule and reign on earth. And they just couldn't wrap their minds around this idea that Jesus was going to <coughs> suffer and that he was going to die and that he was going to rise again. They just couldn't grasp it, the Bible says. And they couldn't grasp it because they had their own agenda. They had their own traditions. They had their own ideas. And I think sometimes the church has gotten so comfortable with what we do on Sunday, we forget that that Sunday is not the totality of our Christian life. It's what we do in between the services when we're out there. That is the mission and the calling of every child of God is to be out there sharing the gospel. So he shares with them what he's getting ready to go through. And we need to be passionate about that gospel. But notice, if you will, going to verse 35. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, certain, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace, but he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. There are two groups of people in here today. The first group of people are those who have received the gift of salvation. These are the individuals who know what Jesus did for them, that he died for their sins on Calvary Cross, that, that he was buried, he arose the third day, and, and they have believed that, they have received that gift of salvation from the Lord, and they are children of God, and you are on your way to heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. There's another group in here. There's a group of people who have never done that. Maybe because you have rejected the gospel, maybe you have never heard the gospel until today, maybe some other reason, but for whatever reason, you have not made that choice to receive that gift from Christ. So we have those who have been reconciled and redeemed, and we have those who are lost and unredeemed. And I would talk to those first who are unredeemed. Jesus died for you. He went to that cross and suffered all of that pain. To pay for your sins and for my sins. The Bible says that he became sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteous of God in him. Jesus took all of your sin upon him so that you might be righteous before a holy God. See, your sin separates you from God. Your sin keeps you from going to a place called heaven. And your sin will take you to a place called hell. And the only way to avoid that place called hell that was made for the devil and his angels is to receive the gift that Christ uh, secured for us with his death and resurrection, receiving that and inheriting eternal life. So if you're here today and you've never, never believed in what Christ has done for you. If you've never called out to him, asking him to forgive you and to save you, you can do that today. I look at this blind man as they're passing through the gates of Jericho, and, and, and I'm amazed at this blind man. Uh, I've read this before, and the Lord just, uh, you know, he, he gave me such joy as I read this, because here's this blind man. He is a beggar. Okay, I don't know how long he's been blind. It's not indicated in this passage of Scripture. So we don't know exactly from this passage of Scripture how long he's been blind. But, but he's blind. He can't see. He can't see anything. And he it has been reduced in his life to sitting at the city gate begging for help from people as they pass by. And here is a man 
that, that is begging for people's help. And one day as he's sitting there, people are starting to come by and he hears the commotion. So he knows something important is going on and he starts calling out to people, hey, hey, tell me what's going on. What, what's happening that's so important? Why is everybody so excited? And, and they said, Jesus has passed by. And without hesitation, this man begins to yell out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You need to understand something about that title, son of David. It is a messianic title. It acknowledges that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. So this beggar, as he sits there, wherever he heard it, however he heard it, he knows about Jesus. He knows that Jesus is this healer. He knows that he is this great teacher and preacher. And he has come to a place in his heart that he understands that Jesus is the Savior, that he is the coming Messiah, and, and that he is the only one who can help him. And so he begins to pursue after Christ, and he says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. If you're here today and you've never received the gift of salvation, if you've never surrendered to the Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You've never called out to him asking him for forgiveness and salvation. You need to passionately pursue Christ today because he's giving you opportunity to receive that gift. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Nobody can do it for you. You have to choose it for yourself. But today is the day of salvation. He's giving you opportunity to chase after him. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Then there was this group, his disciples and this crowd that's surrounding him. Jesus has sat down and, and, and there's this group and they rebuke him. They said, you know what? You need to be quiet. Jesus has more important things to do than to listen to you or to bother with you. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's got all these other things. He's got more important people to talk to. He doesn't have time for you. Just sit down and be quiet. This is the second time we see within this passage of scripture where, where his disciples tried to deem who was worthy enough to come to Christ. Once before it was the children. The disciples were like to the women and children, oh no, leave the master alone. And Jesus says, no, no, forbid them not for such is the kingdom of heaven. Here, the blind man is calling out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they're saying, you need to be quiet. You need to settle down. <laughs> Basically, what they're saying is, you're not worthy enough of this. But I love his passion in pursuing after Christ because he heard what they said and he didn't care. I can imagine in my mind, I at this point, he is standing to his feet and he is screaming out to the top of his lungs, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he got the Lord's attention and the Lord turned and looked at him and he commanded the blind man to be brought to him. And Jesus' question to the blind man was, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, I just want to see. And I'm thinking partly that he's saying, I want to see the tree sway again. I want to see the colors of the sunset. I want to see the colors of the sunrise. I want to see my family's face. But I also believe he wants to see the Messiah, Amen. the son of the living God. Because think about this. Jesus says, receive your sight. And the first thing he gets to see is the face of Christ. And, and this blind man refusing to be told that he is not worthy of the gift that Christ has for him. Being told that he needs to be quiet pursues after Christ, and, and he receives the gift that he asked for. And not only that, he receives his sight, but Jesus says, your faith has saved you. You need to passionately pursue after Christ. And can I say this to those who are redeemed, to those who have received the gift of Christ, you need to passionately pursue him. So many times Christians are like a married couple. We find the love of our life and we get married and then 
after time goes on, we drift apart and we're no longer communicating, we're no longer uh, as in love as we once were, and, and things are no longer as exciting as they once were, and, and then we start questioning if this was the right person in the first place, and we start getting discouraged and things start happening, maybe fights start taking place, and it's all because we, we lost that first love that we had, like in the book of Revelation that Pastor shared with us, the church that lost or left its first love. But if you're here today and you've received that gift of salvation, you need to passionately pursue Christ every day. You need to rekindle that flame each and every morning. You need to rekindle it each and every evening. Christ should ever be for, before you and your relationship should always be growing with him. But that doesn't happen if you're not passionately pursuing him. If you're not communicating with him, if you're not reading his word, then you cannot be passionately pursuing Christ. But this blind man, he passionately pursued Christ. He wasn't going to let anything get in his way. And I challenge you today, if you're here and you're not saved, don't let anything get in your way today. Receive Christ as your Savior. If you're here today and you're saved, don't let anything get in your way. Nothing in this world, nobody in your life, don't let them get in your way of passionately pursuing Christ. Amen. But lastly, in verse 41, or 42, it says, And Jesus said unto him, Receive your sight, thy faith has saved thee. And immediately he received his sight, and I love this part, and followed him. Glorifying God and all the people when they saw it gave praise unto God. We passionately pursue the gospel. We need to passionately pursue Christ. But we need to passionately follow after Christ. To be saved is to be guaranteed of eternity with Christ in heaven. To follow Christ means that you are following in his footsteps to become more like him. When people in this world look at you, you should be a mirror image of Christ. When they look at me, I pray that they don't see Joe's story. I pray that they see Christ in me. Because there is nothing good about Joe's story. There is nothing that I have accomplished or, or anything good in my life that, that I have apart from Christ. And everywhere I go and everything I do should be a reflection of my relationship with Christ. And that's following Christ. That's being a disciple of Christ. And you can be saved and, and have eternity, have your golden ticket to heaven, and still not be a disciple of Christ. Not be his follower. We have a lot of people that fill up pews on Sunday morning, not just in this church, but in churches across this world. We have people who come to church, they'll sing in the choir, they'll do things in church, but throughout the week, they're not following after Christ. They think sitting in the pew and listening to a sermon or to a Sunday school teacher or serving in a, a, a once a quarter rotation in the nursery satisfies their debt to the Savior. Christ saved you for a purpose. And you'll never know that purpose unless you're following after him. This blind man, he received his sight. He was saved by, by the, the, the grace and mercy of Christ. And he immediately began to follow after Christ. He didn't care what anybody else was saying. Jesus healed him. Jesus saved him. And he turned around and he started walking away. And, and he got right behind him and started following him everywhere. And he just didn't follow him. He started shouting out praises. To the one who had changed his life. I wonder if we do that. We need to passionately follow after Christ. Because here's the deal. When you passionately follow after Christ, it's infectious. Other Christians will become infected with your joy, with your dedication, <coughs> with your pursuit of Christ. And it can influence them to do the same. It can influence somebody who is lost and without Christ to, to want to know what's different about you and, and to come and ask and, and you be able to share the gospel so that they too can have what you have. This blind man began to follow Jesus, began to praise the Lord, and all the people that were around who saw all these things, they praised God. This is the Passion Week week of suffering where we reflect on the suffering of Christ for what he did but it is also the passion of Christ 
and that he looked through all the pain and suffering and saw joy. And that joy is you and that joy is me. And as his children, we need to passionately pursue the gospel. We need to passionately pursue after Christ. We need to passionately follow after Christ. Easter shouldn't be just a once a year celebration. This should be our life. So I encourage you today, live it out for the glory of God.